midsummer in Canada's Yukon. Red Surge and Northern Pride stand on guard. The Mounties are at the summit of the Chilkoot Pass, waiting for a team of 19th century gold miners to cross this storied trail. For the past 40 days, four men and one woman have been living in the year 1897. Their food, clothing, and tools are period appropriate to a time when tens of thousands of gold-hungry southerners, called stampeders, came over these mountains like an invading army. They were Americans and Canadians, Russians and Swedes, all driven half mad by the promise of easy Klondike gold. At the top of the Chilkoot, they were stopped by the Northwest Mounted Police, who confiscated guns and booze and made sure every stampeder had plenty of supplies. The modern day team has also carried a back breaking load up this trail. 3,000 pounds of gear, plus a boat. And like the Gold Rush miners, they too must pass inspection. How are you doing today? Good. It's all your stuff? Yes, sir. Who's traveling with you? The production company arranged to recreate this historic scene using serving members of the mounted police. What do we have here? These farms are going to be confiscated by the Northwest Mounted Police. You understand that? Now, is there anything else that you'd like to tell us about your supplies? Pour it on my feet when uh, I get big, bad blisters. Once past the Mounties, the men cast aside everything they were tired of carrying. One of the first things to go, Andrea's sewing machine. So what's happening, Rick? What's getting left and why? Well, we're just going to uh, try to get down to exactly what we need as far as food and equipment to uh, get us the rest of the trip to Dawson. And everything else that we don't absolutely need, we're going to leave here to speed it up because we're taking way too long to get there. We'd like to okay. make up some time. Now, what about Andrea's sewing machine? I'd have to let Andrea answer that because I can only speak from what's important to me and so it, what else is important to everyone else, they're going to have to decide themselves. Right. So if she wants to make her living with that sewing machine, mm -hmm. she has to pack it? Sounds good to me. It's a harsh life. It's a harsh life. But how would Andrea make her living? Um, well... She's a showgirl, isn't she? No. <laughs> no, 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 seriously, because it's, it's important. Um, how does Andrea make a living without that sewing machine? Uh, well, she can... I, I, mean, uh, <laughs> that, I mean, that's a question for Andrea, I guess. So what would your choices be in 1897 without a way to make a living? On this trail. On this trail, I'd have to make a living another way. You know, I'd have to mend things by hand with my needle and thread, with which I can carry. And I'd have to cook, and I'd have to do laundry, and I'd have to think of other ways to make money and to just, or swing some kind of deal with somebody, which really they're not into doing. I don't, I'm not even gonna ask them because I know they're not. For all they care, I could just leave and they'll do my job, because it's not a job anyways, it's just nothing. That's what I think, anyways. I don't feel like I'm bonding with them, I feel like I'm an outsider. When I go to bed, they get out the guitars and they have a good time and they laugh and chuck it up, but when I'm around, they all just be quiet. And it's, yeah, that's tough. If anyone can take it, Andrea Bellon can. A strong northern woman, Andrea is the team cook who runs the kitchen with a firm hand. From day one, she warned the men about eating too much. We're on short supply of everything to last for three months. All the vegetables we have, the little... That little jar is all the vegetables we have. See what I'm saying, people? It's 
The team has enough food to reach the gold fields, but carrying the boat over the mountains left the men hungry and tired. To be strong, they had to eat, hoping that somehow the food would hold out. So what are you writing? That I again find myself hungry. <laughs> it's hard to think of anything else when your stomach's empty. The food issue caused tension, especially when Andrea spelled out the choices they faced. I know, I know. So what do you want? You want me to ration you right now and feed you good along the way? Well, Not I don't, enough? I don't think or you can pig out right now and be starving in two but, months. <laughs> We want more food. The more food we can eat, just the, the stronger we're going to become because the trail is just going to get harder as we go. The men were unhappy, and Andrea was left to make the long crossing of the Chilkoot Pass without her teammates. It's midnight, and they're not here. They're off at home, all comfy in their cozy beds, putting their bellies full. It took her 16 hours to reach the next camp. Six weeks into the journey, they have reached the edge of Lake Lindemann and set up camp at an old trapper's cabin. Lindemann is an important milestone for the Stampeders. The great mountains of the Chilkoot are passed, and bruises can now heal. At this point in the trip, I look back on the, uh, the last 40 some odd days that we've been carrying stuff over the Chilkoot Trail, and as much as it was uh, the source of a lot of pain and discomfort and fatigue and experiencing hunger, uh, that I've never experienced before. Just, um, it's, as much as those are harsh memories, I've, I'm kind of feeling a little nostalgic about leaving this part of the, uh, the trail, this part of the journey behind and continuing on in the water. In 1897, the Yukon was a fabled land, an El Dorado where rivers flowed with gold. The newspapers of the time knew a good story when they saw one and sent a tribe of reporters to cover the stampede. One of the best was Tappan Adney of Harper's Magazine. Lindemann is magnificent. Four miles long with mountains like picture frames. It is alive with the air of hustle bustle. There are 120 tents here and half that many boats being built. The lake echoes with the industry of shipbuilding. Lake Lindemann lies on the Canadian side of the Chilkoot Pass, 24 miles from where the trail begins at Dye, Alaska. The gold fields of Dawson City are over 600 miles north. From Lindemann, the team will sail the many glacier-fed lakes which flow into the Yukon River. As they travel north, they'll need both luck and courage. The water temperature is just above freezing. It'll bring this apart. Mm -hmm. The boat they have carried so far is damaged. The wood is warped, the seals are cracked, and Joe Bishop is worried. He says the Yukon Lakes are killing cold. So he tries something that might have been used in 1897. He fills the joints with pine tree resin. Yeah, that looks really good. Yep. Got to christen it. I got my cup of tea here to christen your boat with. The Yukon Patience. <laughs> I christened the Patience. Woo! And patience it is. Patience on the dangerous waters and patience with each other. 
After all, that's what dreams of gold are all about. New beginnings. This far has not been wasted. The pine resin works and patience stays dry. In celebration of the first voyage, Andrea forgets the rationing for one night and cooks a feast. Barley and carrots, potatoes and bacon. Oh, awesome. Gold Rush Gourmet, 1897 four, style. No, three, no four. Yeah. Yeah. What is there at the end of Lindemann Lake? One Mile Rapids? Yeah, One Mile Rapids. And this water is really cold here, right? That's why I don't want to get too far from shore, is because I want to be able to swim without hypothermia setting in. Definitely what Andrea said about the water being really cold is, is, is as much as the Chilkoot was the hardest part of the trail, the lakes are the most dangerous part of the, the route to the Dawson. That's what's scaring me. Well, mm -hmm. That's what's got my hackles up. Under the midnight sky, another surprise. Joe Bishop, who makes his living as a professional musician, puts on a show. He's been writing songs on the trail, and this is one of them. A little down the road, I know I'm going. A little down the road, yeah. I'll share my Dave Delnia is taking this day for a different type of work. He's the expedition's photographer and is documenting the journey with a rare period camera. And like the journalists who walked these trails a century ago, Dave knows that gold is only one kind of wealth. Went out today and shot some photos, which was great. Uh, a beautiful sunny day. And uh, it's always just good to get out and get to use the camera. Uh, you know, sometimes I'm just packing so hard all day that you just don't get don't get a chance to get all the photos that you want. So um, you got to remember that you know that's part of my job as well, or a big part of my job actually. Lake Lindemann is the first in a chain of lakes leading north. At its end, a dangerous channel. The team must choose between running the rapids or portaging around the rocks. 
What do you think it was like going through here, Rick? Uh, pretty hairy. Yeah. yeah. Especially those boats, you know, if they don't steer very well, it's you're just kind of going wherever the water's going to take you. So. A lot of big rocks right there. <laughs> They're not going to move. The boat's just going to crunch. I wouldn't do it. So, could you run something like this? In, in the proper boat, you can definitely run this. The boat we have, it has no rockers, so it's made the track really well. It goes straight. And you got to have a boat that you can maneuver around these uh, rocks and that. We've got a boat we've carried over the, the Chilkoot. We can carry it this last mile, and we know it's a one piece when we start on Bennett. A century ago, Tappanadney stood on the same spot, but made a different decision. With the speed of a bolt from a crossbow, the scow leaps from wave to wave, drenching us with spray. We avoid by the narrowest of margins jagged boulders, and in a slather of foam shoot out into the smooth water below. The modern-day stampeders were cautious, but that too has its price. The weeks are passing, their supplies are dwindling, and the gold fields of Dawson City lie months away. Speed or safety? The dilemma every stampeder faced. They say uh, an army march is on the stomach, and that's been very true with us, uh, aside from our feet being sore and us talking about that. For the first two weeks, all we've been talking about since is food. It's funny, a couple days ago, a ranger came into our camp and asked uh, Andrea if we sit around the fire and talk about sex, and she said, uh, no, we, uh, we talk about food, and that is on our mind all the time, and I'll show you something that um, Nobody knows we have in here, and it's our uh, burger of the month, and it's right behind me here. So that's our, uh, that's what we talk about, that's what we think about, and that's what we pin up in our tent walls, is food. Lake Bennett. Their hard work to get this far is about to be rewarded. Homemade blueberry and apple pies, $20 each in 1897. The Gold Rush Trail was a busy place. Everything from crates of champagne to cages of canaries was for sale. Tired stampeders often gave up their dreams of reaching the gold fields, choosing instead to set up shop and mine the miners. Really bad things can happen really fast. Your whole, all your gear. And the pies were delivered by boat builder Greg Cheney, who also brought a second boat, a handmade, period appropriate Klondike scow. Lake Bennett once echoed with the sounds of thousands of men making hundreds of boats, many of them scows. Everybody wanted one, including Stampeder Esther Lyons. It took five days to build our boat, a double-ended scow, five feet across and three feet deep. Last year, such a boat cost $75, but during the rush, $400 was cheap. It's the most unusual thing I've ever seen. The old pictures show just hundreds and hundreds of boats in all stages of construction. Some were just little, almost like coffins. And a lot of people capsized, a lot of boats swamped. They were always making the decision between should they have a good, solid, constructed boat or should they get out of here quick. Quality takes time. That means you're going to be behind the guys that just left. But sometimes the guys that just left go out in the middle and sink. 
A lot of people did die, and a lot of people just lost their whole outfit. Wash your face there, Sebastian. That Sebastian, that's doing a rascal way further back, dude. Yeah, but it's really hard. Like the friction of the water. Yeah, but it's really hard to like get the friction of the water. I don't care how hard it is, just do it. Sebastian, you're taking us the wrong way. <laughs> All right, how many kilometers we have to go? 800? The dangers which lie ahead are far from their minds on this glorious day. But the first rule of the Yukon is clear. Send not your foolish. Day 50, and the weather has turned against them. Like many stampeders, no one on this team knows how to sail. With hundreds of miles of lake and river ahead, they'll have to learn fast. The lakes are the biggest worry for me. I try not to worry about them, but I can't stop thinking about those big waves. And that kind of freaks me out a little bit, but I'll just row and paddle and Listen to the skipper. Been on a sailing boat once before I came out here, and I've been in a canoe four or five times before I came out here, so I'm just going to go with whatever the more experienced people say. Two people with the most experience on the water is myself and Dave, so we're going to make sure one of us is on each boat at all times. No matter what we run into, we're capable of dealing with it. I mean, I. The odds are, I don't believe anybody will perish on this trip. It's going to be interesting trying to live on these boats, and uh, especially for me, because I've never spent much time on the water. So it'll be really good. I'm going to learn how to paddle and how to sail, and we're going to build our own sails. We might, we're going to take one of the tents and uh, probably cut them in half to build the sails for our two boats. So that'll be interesting. And, um, and then give her, give her across the lakes. And then once we get on the river, it sounds like we'll just be paddling like madmen and working our way down to Dawson. While they wait for the weather to break, there's plenty of work to be done. We're just taking all the knots off the mast so that we can drop the yard arm really quickly to get the sail down when we need to. Um, they were testing it out here without, without a sail and without any wind on it. It was still just had a lot of trouble sliding on the mast, so smoothing it out as best I can. I started out using cotton thread and now I'm using the sinew stuff because it's so much stronger. So I'm just trying to find a piece of wood like this that we're gonna drill on the front of the boat for the mast. Okay. And I think this piece is gonna be this perfect piece. Hundreds of boats were launched from Lake Bennett, each one carefully numbered. The mounted police insisted on this so they could keep track of those that sank. Hours later, the wind drops, and for once on this epic journey, calm waters lie ahead. The team is Dawson bound. That looks good. We're just about ready. Dawson bound, Dawson bound. Hoist the sail! Everybody knows I'm Dawson Bell. Sebastian, yeah? Take a deep breath. <laughs> I'm not gonna, this, the boat's pretty stable, I'm not gonna let it flip, don't worry. Yeah. Everybody knows I'm Dawson Bell. Wind and rain, wind and rain. Won't send me back to where I came. I ain't ever gonna turn around. Everybody knows I'm Dawson Yeah, don't 
tears when I say goodbye. I'll be thinking of you when I leave this town. Everybody knows I'm Dawson Bell. I since snow, I since snow. Won't bother me none when the cold wind blows. I'll be digging for gold in the frozen ground. Everybody knows I'm Dawson Bell. Everybody knows I'm Dawson Bell. Everybody knows I'm Dawson Bell. You ready for Lefty? All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Right so, on. how was it? First down the, on the I'm line. a lot less scary than I thought, actually. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> right on. Sebastian? Ah, it was great. Yeah. You did well? Yeah. Kind of fun. How was the boat? Uh, pretty good. You move a lot, but just it's stable it's just moving out of the wave and just one time it was one time that we tip a little bit but right. well, we're gonna make her all the way all the way for sure so. everybody knows I'm Dawson Bell everybody knows I'm Dawson The wind has returned. Joe decides that sailing is too dangerous, and another day is lost. If you're uh, wondering how windy it can get here on uh, Bennett Lake, I'm about to show you. So it's pretty windy. Fastest side to fly. Andrea's gonna try to follow him. Yeah, well, we've got a little bit of time. It's just to try to trim up a little bit. Everything out here is hard. You know, just get up in the morning, you know, you got our big bulky bed rolls and stuff's in the boats and stuff's here. And if you want to make a meal, you gotta dig everything out. And, and when you're done, it's not just you know, you throw it in the dishwasher, everything has to be cleaned and put away and kept organized so you can find it next time. Like, nothing is easy. It's all, everything's harder than how, what we're used to. We're stockpiling because we're uh, wind down on the island today to take advantage of the, uh, the opportunity to, to just cook up a bunch of food so if the weather turns good on us, we, uh, We'll just have all that food available so we won't have to be doing much cooking. Right. We don't have a lot of food left, so we're down to bacon and beans and bannock. Yeah, pretty well the beef. And we have butter as well. And brown sugar. And brown sugar and black coffee. For Sebastian, this diet is not enough. He takes matters into his own hands. Squirrel hunting, the old-fashioned way. I think it stays pretty gross because it stays like they eat if they eat spruce, they're gonna taste spruce. But it's just the fact to have meat. I think it's gonna be just the protein and make chicken and beans. And I never tried squirrel, so. So you've never tried? No, but a lot of my friends tried before. Yeah. And you didn't like it? Uh, most of the time it's just to try it and just uh, they wanted to eat meat, so they just have a squirrel. But Sebastian has no luck. The squirrels live on. Let's do her, yeah. Yeah, let's take full advantage of this. And uh, and if we get this, if it storms up on us, then we pull off, and then if we get the same little break tomorrow, then we're around that point. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, yeah. That's it. <laughs> Can I get that to go, please? Thank you. <laughs> the canoe drive-through. <laughs> In 1897, 
less than a quarter of the 100,000 stampeders who left their southern homes made it to these lakes. Journalist Tapanadny did, and crossed these waters in his scow. A gale is roaring, turning the lake into a great sea. Now begins the fight. Whitecaps are boarding us, and our mast bends as if it would break. Not a cove or shelter is in sight, and the wind is getting worse. In the late morning, the weather changes. Who are you? Well, we gotta make sure we're close to shore if this wall's moving our That's way. That's what I'm trying to do. The modern stampeders have sailed the lakes without incident, lack of food being their biggest worry, until nearing a place called Windy Arm. 60 miles south of Whitehorse, between Bennett and Tagish Lakes, is a deadly stretch of water, Windy Arm. As vessels approach the strait between the lakes, a strong south wind drives boats towards Sucker Bay. For experienced crews, Windy Arm is a hard passage. For the Stampeders, it is dangerous. The struggle is useless, the wind too strong. Like thousands of stampeders before them, they are marooned in the Bay of Broken Dreams. So you were rowing hard there. Yeah, that was scary. Some of those waves are so big, it just, you gotta put your oar down and it, you don't even hit the water and then all of a sudden, poof, it's up on you. The whole windy arm just comes hammering onto this beach. It just gets pounded relentlessly. The beach here is a graveyard of shattered gold rush boats. The scow Esther Lyons bought at Lake Bennett was one of them. Few ever pass windy arm without having cause to remember it. And we were most dismally wrecked here. We were obliged to make camp and go looking for food. The rhythms of life on the Gold Rush Trail are constant. Make camp, then look for food. What do you have there? Moss berries. Moss berries. What are moss berries? These little black berries here. They don't taste like much, but when you're hungry, they're awesome. And I've never seen them so many. But as the gatherer, I should be collecting them for, you know, the collective. But... Once again, Sebastian is on the hunt. 55 days into the journey, he is tired of bannock and beans. He wants fresh meat. With incredible luck, they catch a grouse, a successful but bloody end to a 19-year-old's first kill. Dinner for five. 
This is the first one. Maybe we'll get some more. <laughs> Maybe another one tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> mm. Catching the grouse showed they were adapting to life in an earlier time. What came next tested their courage to its limits. Bath time, Yukon style. So what is the water in the Yukon like, Sebastian? Minus 20. I'm going to see what's happening. So is it Watch those rocks, they're sharp. Oh. I'm the only one left. I don't want to go. Come on, Andrea. <laughs> but I'm going to wear my ginch. Oh, that's fine. That's great. That is oh. really good. <sighs> good call, Dave. Early August. The morning sun in this giant land is hot, the earth verdant and alive. But the team has no time for beauty. Only one thing is on their minds, food. Joe Bishop says he knows of an abandoned Klondike village where there might be some berries. As Tap and Adney traveled north, he too thought of food. People talk of starvation. An old-timer once told me that he'd been here 11 years, and every year they thought they were going to starve. He'd been hungry, but he hadn't starved yet. Deserted gold rush towns like this are common along the banks of the Yukon River. The histories of those who lived here lost to the fast-growing bush. This village of ghosts offers up a gift, a banquet of berries. Mmm, that's good. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. Except I keep spilling them into my mouth. Hunger is not so much the problem as it's the, the lack of nutrition that's in the food we're eating. It's not a balanced diet. So stuff like being able to pick berries or catch a fish really helps a lot. In the forest behind the village, another discovery. A Klondike riverboat, a reminder of the time when anything seemed possible. Ghost towns and boats in the bush, empty cabins and long ago miners. In the Yukon, legends die hard and memories are worth saving. Day 70, Andrea has found her rhythm. Her hands are blistered, her face windburned, yet she is at peace. Everybody's working just as hard. They see me that I'm working as hard as them. They don't think that I'm sitting at home sewing all day or reading or cooking. And now they see me working. They see that I'm bone weary as them. 
and that I'm just as tough as them. It's tough hanging out with nowhere to go with four dudes you don't know, and they don't love you. You know, so it's, um, it's another one of those count your blessings and not your troubles things. We've had a lot of bad news on this trip, uh, but the worst bad news we've had came this morning when uh, we found out we were no longer allowed to use butter on our bannock. We've already dealt with running out of beef jerky, bacon, uh, mashed potatoes, oatmeal, and a lot of other things, but um, now no more butter, so we're just eating bannock plain. Another campfire meal, this one with a difference. Joe Bishop promised fresh meat, but it was not what they were expecting. That's overdone. Now the question is, are they hungry enough to eat Joe's gopher for dinner? I've eaten snake before, and I've eaten shark, and I've eaten porcupine. What about gopher? I've never eaten a gopher. I can't wait to eat it. <laughs> no, it's meat, it's meat. Um, I'm definitely hungry. <laughs> but once again, I'm glad I didn't have to be the one that had to bash its head in. That's a big leg. But I'll trade you if you don't want it. There's another leg, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's three <laughs> legs. <laughs> oh, oh. Okay. All right. Oh, good stuff, what's, what's left for you, Dave? Uh, there's a head <laughs> with Cruising teeth and tongue still in it. <laughs> Let's see if I can find the head. There's the head, teeth, oh, yeah. tongue, eyes, the whole bit. Yeah, it's so good. Like it, it tastes like turkey. Okay, hmm. let's have some beans to wash this gopher down. Anybody right. want a lung? I think you got the best part, actually, Dave. Anyone want to try a lung? I'll yeah. try a lung. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This looks good. Does anyone want some gopher skin? Oh, yeah. There's a little bit of heart left. I have a heart. Here, here's the rest of my bones you can pick off. Sounds like a nice Two days and 120 miles north. The Yukon River has carried them to a landmark place in Gold Rush history, Split Up Island. It was here Klondike Stampeders faced a tough decision, stay as a team or go it alone. The gold fields are only two days north. After months of working together, they could now make it by themselves. For this team, the ballet of the evening unfolds with familiar rhythms. But on this warm Yukon night, a tension has returned. Andrea has told the men she's thinking of leaving. Dawson City is close. The smell of gold is in the air, and the ghosts of Split Up Island are restless. I want the gold. So I didn't work this hard to not leave with a nugget. I'm torn between being greedy for gold, gold fever, or if I go and get the job, then I'm guaranteed I can look after myself. If I go out into the gold fields, I'm not guaranteed that I'll survive. As a woman, I can probably get gold by working in town. But now, I've established a kind of a camaraderie with these guys, and I'm torn. Next time on Klondike, the quest for gold, Dawson City. A kind of town where preachers drink doubles. Andrea becomes the first female stampeder to cross the Klondike Trail since the gold rush. And when they got to the summit, 
it was, well, we'll help you get to Dawson, but if you want that, you're going to have to carry it yourself. If we split now, why would anybody that splits now be entitled to any future earnings? The men can taste the gold and make a painful decision. That's next time on Klondike, the quest for gold. Dawson bound, Dawson found. Everybody knows I'm Dawson Bell. Everybody knows I'm Dawson Bell.